Hi, I'm Penny Beeman with You for Paws with Love, and this is... I'm Cindy Campbell of Cindy Campbell Dog Training, and tonight we're talking about focus around distractions, understanding emotions, learning what your dog is feeling and how that will affect their ability to follow directions and learn new things. Yes, it's super important to know what emotion is being caused by that distraction. You know, it could be fear, anxiety-based, or it could be over-arousal, excitement-based, or you somewhere in between. But understanding that is what then allows us to set up training schedules that can, or training plans that can help us to better get past that issue. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. We're going to have lots of fun. Before we actually dive into understanding the emotions, we have to look a little bit about the different stages. And our dogs have a lot more emotions than what we're going to go over tonight. What we're going to go over tonight is more the basic set of six to eight emotions that all dogs feel and understand really despite anything that happens in their lifestyle. So they can add in emotions based on their training and the events they've been exposed to throughout life. But all dogs kind of start with these basic things. So we want to be able to understand how they process those emotions in the environment and when things change in our environment so that we can help them have behaviors that work better for us. So the core ones, I mean, there's the comfortable state where they're just relaxed and chill and happily doing whatever, whether they're sniffing the ground or walking beside you or chewing on a toy, they're just comfortable. So then the next level is either they see something that they're interested in, could be a leaf blowing in the wind or it could be a stick, whatever, or they see something that's simply no fun. They saw it but it just doesn't matter because they've learned it. That doesn't really affect them. It doesn't apply to them. So they can also feel overwhelmed or anxious. Those two, they're opposite sides of the scale, but are both kind of the same level. So overwhelmed is maybe they don't know what to do next or what behavior is expected of them. So they're kind of an in-between flux state. And anxious would be the same, only it's like they're not super afraid of it, but they know that whatever that distraction is, it's caused problems before, so they're trying to keep an eye on it. So from there, they can move into either the wired state. So from overwhelmed, they go to wired, whereas all of a sudden they're super excited about it. And, you know, this is the dog that sees another dog and wants to play. It's like zero to 60 in a second. They're wired and ready to go. Or they can go from anxious to afraid, which is going to have the same reaction of that fight, flight, or freeze kind of natural instinct reaction. And then the last one we're going to go over is the redlined or out of control. And that doesn't really matter if it's on the happy scale going up or on the, you know, nervous, afraid, anxious scale going down. That red line scale is that's the point where, like you've probably heard somebody say before, that they watched a flip switch, you know, a switch flip in their dog. And that's really the red line and out of control. So we're going to talk about those different states and how they, those emotional states impact the behaviors we're seeing. So first of all, we're going to go over the positive or happy emotional states. These are ones that don't necessarily create problem behaviors until they get to that high end of the scale where they're too overexcited. But so that's where we're going to start. The comfortable state of emotions. Um, this is just a chill, relaxed. Your dog could just be laying and watching what's going on. He could be walking, sniffing. But this is really the perfect mental state for us to be put getting in our training sessions when we want to teach something brand new, something we've never done before. We want them to just be comfortable and relaxed. The state of mind is where our dogs are probably most of the time, unless they have some severe anxiety or something like that. But just the kind of regular state of mind, this that comfortable state of emotions 
and it is the best for training. And if your dog's not living in this state, there are ways to get them to live in that state. Correct. If they're not spending the majority of the time here, then you yeah. really need to contact a trainer or a behavioral consultant that can help you arrange your lifestyle so that you have more of this chill time. And it doesn't have to be sleeping like Azul is there in the picture or, you know, just relaxed, but just no. a calm and comfortable state of mind. So then up a little bit more, this is when they see something off in the distance, or maybe they smell something. For instance, Azul's biggest distraction is dogs. And on one of our common walking trails, there's a female poodle that walks it a lot. So if she's anywhere by, if Azul smells her set in the air, or if she's been on the trail just before us, up ahead of us a little bit, and he smells where she peed, he's instantly interested. Now he's looking for her. He knows her smell. It's very distinctive to him, and he's looking for her. He's not really pulling on the leash yet. He's not really being overreactive as far as like trying to find her super strongly, but he's trying to move toward that dog in any way he can mildly. And they could also be trying to move away from the distraction if it's something that's they're interested in, but not really sure about. So this is also an okay state to practice skills that your dog has already learned. So say your dog has just been working on eye contact and they're good with it in the house and they're good with it in the backyard, pretty mild distraction area. And now you're out on a walking trail and they see something that has piqued their interest. That's a good time to call for that eye contact if that's what you've been practicing because you want to up their ability to follow that cue in a more exciting environment. So as long as they have a good general idea of what the cue is and they just need more practice in it, they can do that in the interested or collecting information state of mind. This is also a good place to practice your um steps that you would use, your um, games that you would use to manage your dog when they're in a more excited or aroused state so that you've practiced so that when they are in that excited and aroused state, which you're trying to avoid, it the muscle memory is there and they will do what you want. So if you notice your dog getting like this, it's not the, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's just, it's okay, we're gonna practice this other thing and we'll get use it to your advantage. <laughs> So yes, um, the uh, U-turn that's very common amongst groups. If you are in any Facebook dog groups, you see all the time when you see a distraction up ahead, you do a U-turn, walk the other way. Or if your dog's pulling on the leash, maybe you don't even see a distraction, but they're pulling on the leash. You stop, do a U-turn, things like that. Once you've taught that skill, you can practice that when your dog is in this state to develop that muscle memory great for time to practice that in this state. And the positions game that we learned yesterday along with the orientation game that we learned from yesterday yeah. are great games to play in this slightly elevated, interested state of emotion. So the next step up, and remember we're on the happy side of things. So this is really means your dog is overreacting. In this particular picture, Azul is looking at a pig. Now, this pig doesn't normally take him up a notch into overwhelmed or overaroused, but at the particular time of this picture, the pig had been completely buried in hay, and when Azul went to look in, he thought it was an empty pen, and then he went to walk past it, and the pig st stuck his head up and started his little piggy snoot noises that they make and caught Azul's attention. So it quickly went from calm, neutral, comfortable state to overwhelmed right away because now he's not quite sure what to do. So he wasn't really scared. He'd walked past the pig hundreds of times. But because it took him off guard, it still overwhelmed him instead of just piquing his interest. So when a dog hits this state, you need to be able to help them calm down because you want to bring them back down. So at this state, it might be very possible to get your dog to refocus on you. 
And if you can't get your dog to refocus on you, then you need to help your dog add distance from that distraction, whatever it is. So in Zul's case, he's got a wall to his right and the pig is to the left. So in order to add distance, we have to quickly get forward or back up. And that's where pace changes come in. Correct. Um, this is a good example of where you would use a pace change because yeah. before they get too aroused by right. it. And we're going to learn about pace changes, I think, tomorrow. But keep that in mind because this is a good place whenever they're in that slightly over aroused state. Usually they can still hear your cues. Although one of the studies trouble. I was just doing, just a minute, Cindy, one of the <laughs> studies I just learned, and I kind of did this naturally, but didn't really realize the science behind it. But so dogs work kind of like in not really a power of three, but in a three. So if your normal cue is just come, you know, they may not hear that word come. And you want to avoid saying come multiple times in that state because then you're going to spoil your cue. But if you can add something to it, so the dog tends to hear the third word. So in Azul's case, I would say, hey, Azul, come. <laughs> so that the so that your cue actually becomes the third word that you say doesn't really matter what word you say previously but the first two words get your dog thinking oh yeah i was listening and then they actually hear that third word so that's a great way to try to help them calm down and redirect their focus back to you go ahead well, if, as well the other thing is with the example of hey azul come by saying his name hopefully we have all conditioned our dogs to know their names and that that is highly conditioned and that if nothing else gets his attention the zoo be saying his name will get him conditioned right or it will, it will cause a response of oh look let you know mom called me right and his name I, generally I, means look at me but in that mm -hmm. particular instance if he doesn't look at me right away I'm okay with that. And that's why I proceed to the third word. If he looks at me, great. Then I know I have his focus and then he's not really overwhelmed. But if he's overwhelmed, he's probably not going to look. You can also use the example of another dog. So um, over arousal, we have a dog park that we go to on a semi-regular basis. Only this time of year and with the skill set that is Azul, Azul is currently at, at not quite two years old, we don't go in the dog park with other dogs that we don't know right now. Well, because it's winter and it's a small dog park, a lot of the times the dog park's empty and then he can go in and run around and sniff where all the other dogs have been and he loves it and that's great, which is why we still go. Or sometimes we'll meet a client or a friend that he's played with before and play in the dog park. But so as soon as we turn down the road to go to the dog park, he starts to become over aroused and he's going to be maybe making some noise and he's going to have a really hard time listening anything I'm asking him for. So whether I'm asking him to be quiet or asking for his name or whatever, because he really is just in overexcited mode or over arousal mode because he wants to get there. So the only way I can calm him down is to turn and head back away from the dog park. So I have to make that choice. Can I stand to have him in that over aroused state for the two or three minutes it's gonna take us to get to the dog park? Or if I'm working on a training session with it and I want him to be able to get closer without hitting that over aroused state, then I'm gonna turn and we're not gonna to go to the dog park right now. So depending on what my goal is, and I usually want to have that goal in mind before I head to the dog park, because it's a guarantee he's going to get over aroused when we head to the dog park. That's his ultimate, and it's just going to happen. So I have to be prepared to deal with that before I head that way. Otherwise, he's just going to stay in that state all the way there. So the next one is wired or spazzing. I'm continuing on with the dog park example. I'm going to go on with that because now he starts to get overwhelmed or over aroused when we turn down the road to go to the dog park. But when we turn into the drive to go to the dog park, then he's wired. 
So then he really is God and he can't hear anything. And at that point, it's too late to do anything to try to correct him. Now, hopefully with more time out this summer, we can get past that. But right now the trips are few and far between due to cold weather and ice and whatnot, that at this point we just deal with it. And I know that when we get there, he's not going to be able to get out right away because if I let him out right away, he's not going to be able to hear me. He's going to pull on the leash to get in. He's going to be simply be too excited. So I know that he's already going to hit this overreacting state before we pull into the parking lot. And I have to wait for him out till he can calm himself back down before we can get out. So at this point, the dogs are not going to hear you. Anything you say, any kind of cue you give them when they are in this state and they're overreacting. So it might be happy. They might just really be excited to go play with their friends, which is Azul's case. He's really happy to go play with the other dogs. But it's still, you can't train anything in this state. If you were wanting to use punishment, you may be able to get through to them with a punishment tactic in this state, but I don't train that way and I don't want to use punishment on that dog. And I, so. it would be very short-lived if you use punishment and they're over, they're wired or spazzed. They're yeah, way and it actually aroused. makes them excel to redline faster when you use yes, punishment. Yes, it does. So... But there have been people that use it and swear by it. It's just not the way that I want to train. I have worked really hard to give Azul the skills to self-calm himself down. And he knows he needs to do that before we get out of the car. So because he's had a lot of practice in that self-calming, he can well, do it fairly quickly. It's if, When you give them skills like that, they tend to use them because they don't want to be in this wired or spazzed and out of control state. They want to have some control over what's going on. Even if they're happy and excited, they don't want to be, they really don't want to be, you know, misbehaving. They want to know what the rules are, but they, um, so well, they get into the state periodically. If we they give forget the what the rules are a lot of yeah, times. They forget <laughs> the rules here. And if we give them the tools to keep it down a notch or two, then they can you then they can continue to self-calm and self-soothe. And then they don't get up here. Right. So I want to just look at this picture really quickly because if you don't know what's happening and you don't know either dog in this picture. Azul is definitely wired over aroused. You know, he's the husky mix, black and tan legs that you can see the most of. He's running. His ears are goofy. His eyes are goofy. He's super excited. And for him, if his tail's down like that, he's really excited. So the other dog actually looks like she might be somewhat afraid. She's holding still. Her mouth is a little tight. These two dogs are really good friends, so she's not afraid in the least. She's planning her attack to try to catch him before he runs past her or attacks her. But if you just look at her body language alone, this is the kind of dog that you would expect to have whale eye. It's not there, but you can't see her eyes to tell that. But with the rest of the yeah. body picture, you would think that she would have the whale eye, the extra white around the eyes, and be fearful of this pouncing dog that's about to attack her so they're the best of friends the other dog actually happens to be a service dog as well and they're playing on a beach that is an off-leash beach but since neither one of these dogs are super good at recall if another dog shows up they're both dragging a long line so we have the ability to stop them if another dog comes onto the scene but they're having the time of their lives running and playing at the moment so in the state, you might be able to refocus them, but probably distance and di away from that distraction and trying to distract them with something else, whether that's food, if you have a highly motivated, food motivated dog, or like in Azul's case, one of the things that we do in the summer near the dog park to help them focus more on me is play with the flirt pole, which we're also going to be talking about. I think that one's day four of the workshop. But so things like that, if you have enough energy that matches the energy they're already feeling because of the excitement they see, 
you can sometimes bring them back in and help them calm down with that. So I don't know if you can hear the banging in the background, but my puppy has a very loud bone. So. All right. I heard it. <laughs> okay. So oh. the next one, and this again, doesn't matter if it's the top of the happy side or the bottom of the fearful side or the negative emotions, redlined is totally out of control. Your dog has gone over the edge. That switch has flipped. He can no longer hear you. He's not noticing anything else around him. So no matter how great your food is, you can have a T-bone steak. You can have, in Azul's case, sardines. It does not matter. He cannot hear me. And this is why he drags the long line, like in the picture, because when he, if and when he hits this state, I have to be able to stop him. He's not one to necessarily charge another dog until they get close. He will sit and wait wherever he's at for them to come up to him, but he won't recall. And I have a reactive dog. Cam is dog reactive, so I refuse to be the person that lets my, even though he's happy and friendly, Azul run up to an off, to a dog because he's off leash. So he goes you, off leash. You very, don't want to be rare. that. You don't want to be that dog trainer. No, I don't. He's don't. friendly. Right. It's code for I have no control from over my dog. And when they're in this state, they can't learn. So not only can they not hear you, but this is the wrong time to train them. So this is the time to pull out every management tool you have in your belt, manage the scene, and get distance as quick as possible. Might not always be safe. You might not be able to get that distance. So for in this situation, Azul having the long line, I can walk up the line to get close to him so that he's closer to me. And I can like take him off the trail over to the right is all trees and woods. So I can take him off into the woods to get past if he can't calm down when he's closer to me. So when they're redlined or out of control, that's when you need management because nothing else is going to work at that point. I learned a lot about this with Nick because he tends to be up at that level because he's, um, he's very high drive. And he had issues with fear as a pup. And so I've learned a lot about management and, you know, getting the heck out of there is the smartest and the safest thing you can do for your dog. Right. I have to it, do the same thing with Cam. Now, Cam will, has made great progress because as long as he's in a heel and he sees the other dog and he can see that they're on a leash, and they're in a heel. Cam has no problem. He doesn't overreact anymore. He'll follow me and stay in a heel because he's learned that that's his safe spot. If the mm -hmm. other dog's off leash, that's when we have a little bit of an escalated problem. Now, I've gotten quite good at it. And Cam knows that in that situation, he's to hold his sit stay right behind me. So he might have his head out where he can see the other dog coming around. But he trusts that I'm going to be firm enough verbally and make my body big enough. It's kind of like when you see that bear in the woods, make my body big enough to get that dog to stop before he invades Cam's bubble. Yeah. So but that's a relationship thing that that's the only thing that I have to keep Cam from getting redlined when he sees an off leash dog. I think, Penny, we ought to say that this is definitely an area you want to avoid if at all possible. If if and when possible, because it's not good for the dogs. They're not learning anything. They can't think. They can only react, and we don't want th that reaction. I had Nick get so excited. There was a lot going on. I was trying to get into my apartment. There was a whole big issue with the next door neighbors that were basically blocking the door, and I couldn't get in, and Nick got so excited he bit my arm because he didn't know what else to do. And so it can go into situations where the dog just, it's not something that they would mean to do. It's not something that they intend to do, but they don't know what they're doing. And 
then they direct on, sometimes they'll direct on their handler, sometimes they direct on other people, and we don't want that. We absolutely right. don't want that. This also happens to be the fallout state for those that do use punishment. Yes. So if a dog is fearfully reactive to a, another dog and you put a device on, whether that be a prong collar, shock collar, choke collar, doesn't really matter. But if you put something that causes the dog pain when they get overexcited, they're going to skip that overexcited state and end up right in the red line state because they've learned that no matter what, they're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And so they will automatically flip to redlined. And I mean, a dog can easily go from comfortable to redlined quickly, you know, in just a second or two, if the emotion that's the distraction that's triggering the emotion is strong enough. You know, if that emotion is so rooted into them and they've had practiced it so much, they can easily go from calm to redlined in a second skipping all the other states so that's where you really have to know your dog or they can trigger stack and get in and go from calm to red line right um, but we don't need to get into trigger stacking right. right now and we're still on the happy side and here we are talking about the not so happy side <laughs> so now we can take a look at the negative and or the unhappy emotional stages now all of these stages I try to avoid as often as possible. Some of them might be necessary, but I want to limit all of these stages, even though they might not be extreme, just because I want my dog to have the best life possible. That's what force-free training with positive reinforcement is all about. So let's kind of review those. So the no fun or uninteresting state. That's where your dog is just, um, he's not in his optimal state for learning. He's not really into whatever it is you're doing. And you can add energy to help engage your dog, but that doesn't mean they're still going to like what it is you're doing. So in this particular picture, so we had just done a cooperative care exercise with combing, and I was just using a standard, you know, a person's comb, so nothing major, nothing big, but it was something new to Azul, and it was something we were doing as part of another workshop, and he wasn't really into it. So after the exercise, I was trying to get him to not be in his pouty or no fun state that he was in. You know, he wasn't hurt. He wasn't super upset. He was just slightly not in his comfortable state. So the rope that's kind of dangling on his nose is a tug toy that he absolutely loves. It is usually one of his favorite things to do. But you can tell from his face that he is not interested in playing. He does not want that toy. So he is kind of a powder, typical husky. He... He's upset with the fact that I touched something to him. <laughs> Even though we tried to do it, I'm trying to reinforce him for doing the cooperative care exercise with me. Even though I knew it was something he really didn't want to do and we were taking it slow, but he's not taking my reinforcement. So I had to up the reinforcement to get him out of his po positive or out of his grumpy mood. So he's definitely not having any fun and he's uninteresting. The same would, apl would apply to nail trims. He tolerates nail trims. He'll lay there and let me do it, but it doesn't mean he loves it or he's happy about it. So from that no fun state is where they go into an anxious or possibly an unsure state. They're not comfortable. They might have a mild fight or flight response. You know, they might pull a little bit toward the distraction or pull a little bit away from the distraction, depending on what it is. They might whine a little bit. They might be darting back and forth, you know, with their eyes, looking at the distraction and looking at you and back and forth kind of rapidly. They're, they're really not enjoying themselves and they're not sure what they're supposed to be doing or what comes next. So this is a yellow state, not quite horrible. Um, it's usually when things are very unpredictable or, or unknown, something they haven't seen before. 
you might see this really common in a puppy who is young that has maybe never seen a fire hydrant before, or there's a bag blowing in the wind and they've never seen that before, or things like that. And they just don't know what to do. They don't know whether to be happy or sad about it yet. So they're just kind of anxious and unsure. So learning can happen in this state, but it's not necessarily enjoyable and it often leads to frustration. So if this is the case of the puppy and they see a fire hydrant, and obviously the fire hydrant isn't moving, you know what it is, you know it's a safe thing, and you have high value treats in your hand, you might be able to coax the puppy to get closer at their level, don't pull them closer, but you might be able to lure them closer and giving them that food a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, until they're close enough to either sniff or touch the distraction. And then they, after that, they usually kind of go, oh, I was afraid of that. And they're yeah. fine. Or, or alternately, you, did, you can do it without food. What I've done with Nick, because he tends to be a fussier about what he takes and when he takes it as far as food is, I let him approach it at his pace. Yep. I just take him over, let him approach it at his pace without rewards and let him and without forcing him and without rewards and let him sniff on it. And if it's something like a fire hydrant, that's really cool because they get to read the female. Right. Yep. Azula once saw a Bigfoot statue and Azula is pretty rock solid when it comes to fears. Not many things scare him. But this Bigfoot statue was life-size. I mean, it was almost as big as my husband, who's 6'4". And it was in kind of a stalking pose. And so, I mean, I definitely understand that fear. And when mm -hmm. I went to walk up to it, he was very hesitant. Like, he doesn't freeze often, but he froze. And he did not want me to get close enough. But I finally was able to get close enough with him stretched out because I had a really long lead. I think it was about 20 foot at the time. So I was able to get close enough and touch it myself and knock on it. And as soon as I did that, he went, oh, and he ran up to it, stopped about a foot back, sniffed it, got a little closer, you know? So, I mean, he came at his own pace and then he realized, oh yeah, fine, no big deal. And that sniffing can be a huge reward for them. Right. As they get up to it because then it's like, oh, there's nothing scary here. I just smelled it. Oh, that's actually smells kind of interesting. Right. And it's not moving. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what the anxious or unsure state of mind is about. They're not really comfortable with it, but it still is possible to teach them that it's okay, that it's a good thing. So then you get into the afraid or frightened state. And if you look at Cam, he definitely looks afraid in this picture. Again, this is kind of a staged picture because he's not really afraid. Um, Azul is just out of the screenshot and is, they're playing and roughhousing. But if you're not really familiar with body language, or even if you are familiar with basic body language, if you ever watch dogs play, a lot of times they have similar body language that looks like he's afraid. Azul is coming down off of a pretty tall snowbank right at him. So Cam isn't quite sure what's going to happen. And Cam is bigger than Azul, but since Azul's coming from the top, he might have a slightly fearful response, but they play all the time. He's not really fearful of Azul. So, but that's the same look he would have if an off leash dog came running at him. They look the same, only if an off leash dog came running at him, He's either instant, he's usually typically pulling, he hits red line and is pulling toward the dog because he's going to attack first. That's what Cam does. In this particular one, the fact that he's scrouching down and not necessarily trying to move away, that, that's how I know he's not really afraid of Azul. He may not be sure of what's happening next, but he's not doing his typical flight or fight response that you would normally see in an afraid dog he's still playing the game so when a dog has this fearful reaction when they are actually truly fearful you need to put distance between them and the trigger in whatever way possible 
And as so, fast as possible. And as fast as possible. Because something bad is going to happen if you don't. You don't want it to escalate beyond this. Sometimes you can still control your dog. They may still, if they're well-trained and you have cues that have been reinforced highly, you may be able to get them to follow your cue, you know, do that U-turn and go back. For Cam, he knows heel. And if it's one of those places where we really can't move, where we're more trapped, say we're in the woods or something, and we can just get off the trail, then he's going to sit behind me and let me control the scene because he trusts me to do that. But it took me a good three to four years of working with Cam to get him to have that kind of trust with me. So it's not an overnight thing. If a dog is hitting the state regularly, you really need help from somebody that can explain the body language and help you come up with a management plan to prevent it from happening. And then also teach the skills in games and training so that your dog has that memory, muscle memory recall to know what to do when something like this does happen. And when a dog gets up in this area of, of feeling, and it can be positive on the positive side or the negative side, it takes about um, 72 hours for them to come down from an, an arousal state like this where they're afraid or frightened, or especially if they're redlined. And that's like 72 hours of calm and quiet and, you know, chews in the crate or chews on their bed and just not in a, in a, an no triggers now, no, no even triggers mild a, triggers, <laughs> no triggers in an environment that's um, calm and quiet and non-stimulating as possible. And um, that helps them to just learn to relax. Now, in our case with service dogs, that's not always possible because, you know, maybe you have to go to Walmart one day and that pretty much fills everybody's bucket just walking in there, um, not to mention the zoo that tends to arrive. But, and then the next day you have to, you have I don't know, you have classes all day or you go to work all day with your dog. And then the third day in a row, you gotta go back to work. You know, you've got, and then you've got a kennel club meeting, you gotta take your dog to, that stacks up. But as- None of them, them might be all that bad on their own, but when on you their own them all together. But it, add, but it adds up over time. And so you want to make sure that you have calm, relaxing behaviors at home. And then you also want to make sure that your dog is educated on how to deal with that level of stress um, so they don't get upset. Like it, it, I took Nick to Portland last August and we literally were going nonstop for two days. I left at seven o'clock in the morning flew to Portland, got on a um, train, went out to Gresham, met with my trainer, came back, got my hotel room, slept. Then we got up in the morning, went out and met my trainer again, and then came back on the train and um, went directly to the airport and um, flew home. And by the time we got home, it was like six o'clock at night. So we were going nonstop. Well, I gave him the next three days off just because he'd been such a good boy, <laughs> but also because he needed that time to just chill out and decom decompress. And I think we've, as humans, we've all felt that. And, but we need to allow that for our dogs. Right. We also need to kind of take a look at, it doesn't matter whether that trigger, that distraction trigger is dangerous or not. It's whether the dog feels that it's dangerous or not. Right. They can point spiders. Most spiders aren't poisonous or dangerous. But how many people flip out over spiders? And it can be anything. For me, my trigger is mice. I don't like mice. I can tolerate them if we're out in a field because we do walk a field quite regularly. But I wear my boots when I'm out in the field and I usually have jeans on. And I know that if I see a mouse, I'm going to be relatively safe because it doesn't want me. It's going to run away from me and try to get the tall grass of the field. But take that same mouse and put it in my house. 
and it's still smaller than my hand and I could probably still easily step on it and squish it. But in my mind, that might as well be a lion in the house. Mm -hmm. You know, it is dangerous. And no matter what I do in my brain, I can't change my brain to think that. I have tried to heavily reinforce that. But so far, I'm not quite there. Maybe it doesn't make me go to the afraid frightened anymore. That's not true. I screamed like a little schoolgirl the other day when I had to see one in the puppy's mouth. So <laughs> I actually had to touch that one too. It was so gross. But <laughs> it's just really important to keep in mind that it doesn't matter if that trigger is really dangerous or not. If the dog feels that it's dangerous, we have to respect that feeling. We have to respect that emotion in them and do everything we can to help them feel comfortable, whether that's distance, whether we can do it with food, whether we need to just let them have time to watch it, whatever it is that they need, we have to respect that they believe that that thing is scary. Mm -hmm. All right. And then redlined. Of course, this is another staged photo because these dogs are also good friends and are playing. But the last time they had played before this particular thing, the Great Dane was smaller than Azul. And at this point, she's got about 20 pounds on him at the time of this picture, about 20 pounds heavier and a good two inches taller than him. So... He's played with Danes bigger than that even, but so he might have been slightly unhappy by the fact that she put her feet on him because she was so heavy, but he's not afraid. It's a good look of what happens when a dog redlines though. They're tipped over the edge and they can no longer hear you or notice anything else going around in their environment. This is when you grab your own dog and they can turn and bite you because they don't realize it's you um, because they're really, they're focused on this is bad and I have to end it. That's all they're thinking. This mm -hmm. is bad and I have to stop it. Or this is bad and I have to get away from it. But if they feel they can't get away from it, they're going to try to fight it, stop it make it go away, make it want to go away from them. So again, in the red line state, they cannot learn anything. And this is where, again, you have to have that management tool. This is more an instinct kind of state than training. And the training that you've done previously is not going to help in this state. And that's why we really need to prevent it and manage it and keep it from happening. This is where you take whatever you have to to drag your dog away from the situation if that means you know you've got a gentle leader and a harness on them and it takes two hands one hand on each leash um, for the harness and the gentle leader to move them out of the situation that's what you do um, I've had to have a second person help me with Azul course. before. Not that his was fear-based, but his was overexcited based, and I could not physically get him to walk with me. Well, the other thing, Penny, I, I didn't hear you mention it, but I've but um, one of the other things that I have learned is if you're in calm, relaxed, happy land, you have to jump up to excited land and then over to unhappy land to get into this real red line out of control negative whereas um so you have to take two steps from calm happy land so it's in most really, cases the dog will take those multiple steps but they don't have to they don't have to but whereas if they're in calm unhappy land it's only one step to get up here yeah um, so it's in our best interest, if we can figure out, it can happen to... either way. If the ha if they're happy emotions oh, yeah, that are leading to it, way. it generally takes longer. If they're negative emotions leading to it, it generally Much happens more. more quickly. Which is the right. point you're trying to make. That's exactly the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> and it's in our best interest to keep them out of that red line. Right. So to pull it all together and make it a little bit easier, I have this document. And these files, I'll share this in the workshop that we're doing. 
the Focus Round Distractions Workshop. It's an open document that anybody can see. You can download it to your drive or save it as a PDF, whichever you prefer. But so it kind of shows everything we've talked about. Comfortable being blue in the middle. And you can go either way to interested or no fun in that salmon kind of pinky color. They're both basically the same level. You can train in that color, but it might not be perfect for training something brand new. You, want, you can practice what you've already taught in those levels, but you don't want to teach something new right there. Mm -hmm. And then the yellow levels of anxious or overwhelmed. They're pretty equal, and it just depends on whether it's a happy emotion or a not-so-happy emotion that's causing it. And so you kind of get the picture of how your dog moves. They can move up or down. Either way, if you let it keep happening, it's going on over and over and over again, they're going to end up redlined. Whether it's a happy redlined or a negative redlined, they're still going to end up redlined if you don't do something to change what's happening and to get them to come back down closer to that comfortable state. So it's game time. We've talked about emotions and now we get to look at kind of the different games that we can play that can help you when your dog is having emotional things going on, you know, if they're in that yellow state. So do you want to talk about your game first since I've done most of the talking on this one? Okay. So my game is the distraction marker and what you're trying to, what the, uh, the, objective of this is, if I can talk, the objective is to teach the dog a, a marker that you, that it's a noise that you make that means, look at me, pay attention, you're distracted by something else and you need to focus on me. And some people use a kissy noise like a, and, but I generally don't because my dog's a service dog and I don't want people kissing at my dog. They already do that enough. I don't want my dog responding to that. So I don't use that particular one. Um, I guess I can make the noise I use because he's got a treat by his nose. I um, generally will make a noise. It's kind of like a type noise. And the purpose of doing that is so that he goes, oh, mom made a noise. Maybe I better look at mom and get his focus back on me. And um, when he does that, he calm, He goes, okay, I'm calm, mom's right there. I don't need to worry about that bird or that, that squirrel over there. I need to be concerned about what mom is doing. It's a really good game to play. So what is a really good distract? destruction instructions and how to teach that game and different tips and tricks for it so so the best way to teach it is just make the noise and when the dog looks at you you reward them it's super simple and then as they start doing that start doing it when you take your dog out and continue doing you know continue doing that and rewarding it every time you make the noise reward them whether they're paying attention or not. And I um, only made the noise because the dog has a piece of food right in front of his face that he can get at, but he's asleep. <laughs> right, that's one of those when you're using a specific noise like that, you don't wanna make it without a reinforcement of some type nope. because then it becomes less effective. It becomes very le significantly less effective, but I've used it in so many situations where it just pulls him right back to me. Oh, I've got to pay attention to you. And it's, um, it's really simple. It's basically make the noise and treat the dog. And when they look at you. Right. And, and it doesn't it, have to be a treat. You can play a game too, but, yeah. but it's reward the dog that they want. Well, the I guess by treat, I mean reward because that's, I mean, you're still giving them something that they want. Right. So um, that's a really, it's just a really helpful thing to have. Um, and it's a good thing to start 
with young puppies, if you have a young puppy that you're starting on or the day you get your dog, it's a very good thing to start because you wanna re reinforce that as much as you possibly can so that your dog will have a very strong distraction marker um, so that, you know, if you're out and you, you know, and people are distracting your dog, you can do something about it and you don't have to bark, leave it at them. Right. So my game for the today, it has a couple of different names. It can be called the Q game, or I think you had another name for it too. Something Q something. Play Q play. Yeah. That's your version of it. So for me, I just simply call it an on off switch. But basically, that's what it is. Um, you can take your dog's favorite game, whatever that may be. So when I first taught Azul how to play this, it was a simple tug rope game. And so we would be playing. And the first thing I taught him was, if I drop the toy, you turn off. So when you're playing with a young puppy and a tug toy, what happens commonly when you drop the toy? They come after your hands. So that's kind of where I start with that. I don't want him coming after my hand. So if I drop the toy, he has to just stop and wait. And as long as he stops and waits, I'm going to grab that toy and start playing again. Or I'm going to produce a second toy to start playing again. And that's kind of the beginning of it. But then as you progress, you can add more difficult criteria to where like you're throwing in a cue. So... We might be playing tug and then all of a sudden I can say stop, which he knows now is his stop cue. And so, or drop is a common one in this particular case too. And he'll stop and wait for the next cue. And typically then I'll like tell him to sit or something so that I can back away from him a few steps and hold the toy up in the air to make it exciting. And then I'll say, okay, now get it. And we go right back to play it and we'll repeat that a few times. And we'll usually do that for a few different training sessions. But once you do that, you can add in another cue. And the more you do it, the more cues you can add. So you're teaching your dog to go from that excited state back into that more neutral state simply on cue, which is a good brain game for the dog. And it kind of helps them learn how to self-regulate. So I was given the example at the dog park as well knows he's not getting out the door until he calms down. It's because we've been, played so many different cue games where when he has gotten excited, he's been given a cue that doesn't, that can't be done in that excited state, such as sit. I often, I don't use sit very often when I'm doing things because I don't want Azul to make his, you know, wear his hips out all too early being a service dog. But I'll use things like that. Just like if you don't want them to jump, you ask them to stand between your legs or Azul knows the cue wait means stand wherever he's at and not move and things like that. So you, the, when you play the cue game, you get them a little bit excited. So you don't want to get them overexcited, just mildly excited so that they can still listen and you can help bring them back down. And the more you play, the higher excitement level you can raise in the game, and they can still learn to come back down to a neutral state. And you can play it with multiple different types of toys. Nick right. has three sets of toys he plays with. He's got um, a chaser that he plays with. He's got a um, flirt pole that he plays with. And he's got a squirrel that he plays with. And we play with those slightly different, but he has the same, he has multiple cues. The other thing is when you're to the point of proofing a cue and you wanna make sure that cue is solid before you take it someplace, this is a good way to really drive home that cue because right. they really, because you're really giving them, it's like, okay, you have to eat your peas and then you can go swimming. And, then you can have your ice cream and go swimming. So um, you're going to eat your peas because you're going to, you want your ice cream and to go swimming. So right. this is similar. It's a pre-Mac type thing. Right. 
if you want to have your cake and eat it too, you mm -hmm. got to think about it first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not to think about what you're doing. So yes, that is the on off switch. I'll have simple instructions for if you're just starting out. I'm working on that with puppy right now because when she sees a person and I'm glad that this has been her conditioned response to people so far, but when she sees a person, she instantly goes into, oh, they're gonna pet me. So she instantly is, you know, zero to a hundred in a second, wanting to rush up to them and get her pet. And as soon as they start touching her, she melts and calms down. But I don't want her running toward every single person. So we're working on in our toy play when we have no other people around, this on off switch so that when she sees the person, she can look at me first. And I can tell her we're either going to leave it or we're going to heal or we're going to stay. Those are all kinds of the things we're working on. And then as that person approaches and they stop, then I can give her permission to go greet. And then, you know, if she rushes to get to them extra fast at that point, I don't mind. But I don't want her rushing to get to them without that kind of permission because she is a service dog in training, not for myself. She's not my puppy. I just have her for 12 days, kind of working on some basics, but we want her to start to develop that on off switch because it's something that she doesn't have at five months old. And it also teaches, dis uh, it teaches arousal up, arousal down, and it teaches disengagement because they have to disengage from the toy to um, do the cue whether it's the drop toy or disengaging from you. So it's a really handy, it, it hits on multiple levels on shaping things we want in the brain. And it, it's one of my favorite games to play with the, with the pups. Right. We can't expect that dog to disengage from a squirrel or a bird or another dog. And if we can't get too. them to disengage from a toy in mm -hmm. our house. So... That bird, squirrel, dog, whatever it may be outside is going to be far more exciting than any toy you have in your house. So we have to teach them how to do that disengage, how to turn off and come back to us when that excitement happens. If we don't teach it at home, they won't get it. So <laughs> that's what the game is designed to do. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, it's just... I can't say enough good stuff about it. It's helped Nick so much. Right. We've played it a lot at his little stage too. So, and all the way through the teenage stage, it's a great game. Yep. You might have to amp up the games you're playing and the toys you're using in order to get the same response when you start working around more exciting distractions, such as we take the flirt pole to the dog park, not to the dog park, but outside of the dog park. And we typically start at about 200 feet away. And Azul will be on a long line that's attached to me so he can't get to the dog park. But anytime he disengages from me playing with the flirt pole to go check out the dog park, I know he's too close and too excited and we'll back off for a little bit and play where we're at and then slowly make our way closer again. So with practice, we, you know, we were down to about 30 feet away from the dog park last year but winter has hit and it's not happening because snow is too deep. So that's something we will have to restart again, probably at the same 200 feet, if not further, when we have nice enough weather to do so. so just because he has that great on-off switch, it doesn't mean he's going to be able to do it around his most exciting distractions without practice. And, you know, it takes a while to build up these games and these skills and to shape their brains so that they understand so that they learn to make the good the better choices right and that's okay um you know it just we've got to give them confidence and the more games we play the more confidence we give right. them so be sure to check out the videos that are going to be attached with this day to show you exactly how to play this game and then keep in mind, you want to slowly add in distractions when you're playing games. You're going to see progress in just two to three weeks for milder distractions. But you might have to play for six months, eight months, 12 months.
before you're actually going to see a change around their largest distractions. So you got to kind of remember what it is and how exciting it is to them. And you have to match that. So, but everybody has to start small and you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So work the dog in front of you at their pace and at with distractions that they're comfortable playing the games at. And don't worry about your dog not being perfect. No, no dog is perfect. They all go through a adolescence and young adult. They all struggle with it. Just it, some are just better at getting through it than others. And what it boils down to is how well they do is a lot of it is how much time and energy their handler is willing to put into training them. Even adult dogs are going to face distractions that you didn't anticipate or didn't mm -hmm. predict that you didn't train around that could still easily send them over threshold or in that red line state. So right. it's not an end all be all. They're going to be fine around all distractions always. No, it's giving them the skills to handle the distractions as best as possible, given the surroundings and the environment they're in. Yeah, I mean, I had my rock solid Great Pyrenees get a little agitated because she had a tiger coming at her. I don't blame her. Uh, I yeah, was, that I was like, I want out of here too. And, um, you know, you don't necessarily know what, how your dog is going to react in a situation like that. Well, her job was to protect me. So she felt her job was to get me out of there. So she did. But then she sat and uh, we were watching do a dolphin show. And then she sat and she stared at the gate where the tigers were and made sure that, and the lot and the, um, made sure I was okay and safe. But you can't necessarily, I mean, there I could have anticipated the tiger, but you can't necessarily anticipate things. I was walking down the street and ran into a guy with a boa constrictor, you know, <laughs> so you never know what's going to happen. Right. And so um, we hope you're enjoying the workshop so far. This day was a little bit longer, but it was really important to get all the information out there about emotions, because until you understand the emotions your dog is experiencing, you can't really train around distractions. You have to be able to read your dog and you have to know what they're feeling. You have to kind of put yourself in their shoes. Um, so even if something is not a scary thing, if your dog is afraid of it, you have to accept that as their truth and you can work on it, but you don't want to flood them with it. Nobody wants to be dropped in the lion's den or put in a hole full of snakes or covered by a million spiders. Nobody wants that. And we should not expect our dogs to be okay with that either. We want to protect their optimism, but we right. also want to prepare them for what they have to, to deal with in life. Right. So there's a whole lot more information on this available that we will have out there for you, you know, either on the Youper Paws blog, um, just kind of a sneak we're going to have at the end of the week. Uh, if your dog is an adolescent, we're releasing a new classroom that has a whole lot more about focus around distractions than what we're doing in this mini workshop. So we do have a lot of resources already developed to help you with this. We know we're kind of just touching the tip of the iceberg on a lot of these things. So if you want more information, our contact information is up on the screen. You can contact myself or Cindy. We like helping people through this. So if you need help, let us know. Yes, we both had challenging dogs. So we've had some experience personally with challenging dogs and we're more than willing to help you. Right. So uh, we're going to cut it short there. We know this video is long. We hope you come back for day three. We have more exciting fun for you on day three. It's only going to get better as the week goes on.